Welcome everyone to today's webinar. I am Laura Deirda with Becker's Hospital Review. We will begin today's webinar with a presentation and we will have time at the end of the hour for a question and answer session. You can submit any questions you have throughout the webinar by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled enter a question for staff and clicking send. We are looking forward to hearing your questions. Today's session is being recorded and will be available after the event. In about a week following the webinar, we will be sending all registrants a copy of the presentation to in a, the email you use to register. At this time, I am pleased to turn the floor over to Corey Spears to begin today's presentation. Thank you, Laura, and welcome all to our webinar about the DaVinci Project. My name is Corey Spears, and I have personally been involved in healthcare interoperability and standards development for about 20 years now. I'm currently director interoperability standards at Infor. If you're not familiar with the Infor name, we are the developer of the Cloverleaf integration engine and other notable interoperability and ERP products. As a company dedicated to bringing world-class interoperability solutions, we see it as, our part, as part of our responsibility to provide opportunities to help inform the healthcare industry about new and innovative initiatives in the healthcare industry for the better. And Da Vinci is the Da Vinci project is certainly a big one. The healthcare industry has made up of a lot of, has made a lot of technical improvements over the last 20 years in the area of EHRs and interoperability. Um, but one area that certainly could use a boost is the coordination around how that care is paid for. In the age where we have practically um, practically live with all the world's information at our fingertips, each person would be really amazed at about how much is actually done via faxes, mail, and phone calls between the providers and their health insurance companies. Uh, I'm sure most of you listening to this webinar are, are painfully aware of it. This is why we believe that the new proposed changes to CMS in the form of interoperability and patient, in the form of the interoperability and patient access rule could be rev a revolutionary step in provider payer coordination. The goal of the Da Vinci Project is to not only see the goals of this rule carried out, but also extend beyond that in the same spirit of reducing provider documentation and process burdens, improving coverage and cost transparency, and improving patient experience, all through the creation and implementation of data and workflow interoperability standards and specifications. And that is why we are in for are pleased not only to sponsor this webinar, uh, about the DaVinci Project, but we are also an active member participating in the development of these things that bring to the market solutions that will help providers, pairs alike, to realize the value promised by these efforts. So with that, I would like to introduce our esteemed speaker today, Alexandra Goss, whom I have always referred to as Alex. Uh, so I hope she doesn't mind too much if I call her by the name that I've, I've always known her by. Uh, for 30 years, Alex has held leadership roles in developing national healthcare standards, implementing and complying with federal regulations, and aligning business strategies, systems, integration, and operations management in both private and public sectors of healthcare. This includes her roles as Executive Director of the Pennsylvania's Agency Overseeing Statewide Health Information Exchange and Chair of the ASC X12 Insurance Committee. Alex is currently serving her second term as a member of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services National Committee on Vital and Healthcare or Health Statistics, where she is the co-chair of the Standards Subcommittee. She also serves on the Office of the National Coordinator's Fire at Scale Task Force, or FAST. Alex supports the DaVinci Project as a part-time consultant, and she's held many roles involving healthcare policy regulations and standards across the spectrum of organizations and initiatives, many really too, too numerous to mention here, um, because I want to make sure that we provide the adequate time uh, to actually hear from her. So without further ado, here's Alex to tell us about the Diversity Project. Alex? Well, thank you, Corey. I appreciate the uh, introduction. Um, I understand from the chat box that there are uh, some challenges uh, with the audio, so hopefully uh, I'm coming clear, uh, clearly through for everyone. I'm excited to be here today to talk to you about the DaVinci Project. 
so first I want to just get a, a quick check, um, make sure that there, the choppiness was able to be fixed uh, by the Becker's team. Um, if not, please someone let me know. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and proceed uh, with the uh, presentation we've designed for you today, which is to give you an uh, an introduction to the Da Vinci Project and to talk about uh, the body of work, uh, the standards that are being produced uh, by the private industry group uh, within the HL7 uh, umbrella, and uh, to uh, take a little bit of a deeper dive into a few of the uh, specific use cases that we're tackling that may be of interest to you. As I know, prior authorization is a pretty important topic in today's healthcare landscape. So let's start out with why Da Vinci came about. Uh, as we as a country have been making a shift from volume uh, to outcomes focused, we can think of this also as the fee for service to value-based care transformation in the healthcare reimbursement and delivery models. Uh, it was clear that uh, we needed to have the capabilities to effectively exchange information among our trading partners of payers and providers as they were uh, delivering uh, services uh, to our citizens and patients uh, so that we would have the right information at the right time uh, to support the care delivery models and the reimbursement methodologies. This sea change is a, is a journey. It is not an immediate change. And as we have uh, tipped toed into the water of value-based care, it became very clear to a number of industry participants uh, that we had gaps in our ability to effectively change information. We've learned as an industry uh, from the HIPAA and the high tech uh, efforts uh, over the last 15 to 20 some years uh, that standards are an a really important foundational piece of what we do for exchanging information and to enable us to do that in an effective and interoperable way. So to sort of handle the chaotic kind of data needs that we were having as value-based care emerged, uh, industry leaders got together and decided to work together to create the standards we would need for value-based care. The goal being that we would create standards that could be picked up by everyone in the industry and incorporated into the workflows and the software products that we use for delivering care and reimbursing care and communicating with our patients. So the, vo the goal of avoiding technical debt could be accomplished by creating implementation guides using modern technologies. Uh, and we are using the FAST Healthcare Interoperability Resource, or the HL7 Internationally Recognized Standard of FHIR, F-H-I-R, to enable us to craft implementation guides. These implementation guides are sort of the rules of the road that people can use to accomplish information exchange between the payer and the provider community. These implementation guides will underscore our efficiency and value-based care. The thought leaders are pretty substantial uh, that came together to create the Da Vinci Project, which is a private sector project that is working within the HL7 community as a fire accelerator program. So what that means is that industry representatives have come together, have created a framework for us to collaborate, and are working within the HL7 uh, standards community to understand the pain points of value-based care and then figure out how best to solve those using the FHIR standard so that the implementation specifications can be picked up by EHR and payer vendors and incorporated into the technologies that we use on a day-to-day -day basis and so that the healthcare delivery and reimbursement systems can actually modify their workflows, thus reducing burden by increasing automation and more efficient data flows. So in a couple of years, about just a little over two years, the Da Vinci Project 
focus on value-based care has been driving standards for the exchange of information critical to patient care. We're really focused around that provider-payer relationship, understanding that we have vendors uh, that will help enable the implementation specifications to come to fruition, but recognizing the partnership of the payer and the provider community in adopting these and actually garnering the efficiencies from these new standards that we've developed. Let's just take a little bit of a deeper dive into what I mean by uh, the Da Vinci Project building standards. At a very high level, this slide gives you sort of a snapshot of the Da Vinci Project and what we've been doing in the last year specifically related to our use cases. So our membership identifies the, the primary pain points in value-based care exchanges. As a community, we prioritize those and define the requirements related to the clinical, business, technical, and testing aspects. We create an implementation guide that gives us the rules of the road to define, a, to address a specific issue. And along the way, we're actually testing out that implementation guide with sample code to prove out the implementation guide could work. And then we follow some HL7 related processes uh, to ballot our information and get a broader set of perspectives and feedbacks that enable us to take an implementation guide specification to an official status. As you can see, the ones in the red color are very, a much, much more mature implementation guides and are ready for the marketplace to pick up and use today. At the same time, the DaVinci membership has not only been testing it, but they're on their own path to deploying the solutions. We're going to talk a little bit more about uh, the use cases, but I really wanted you to understand on this slide that the DaVinci Project has repeatable processes that we're using with our membership and the public at large to advance the implementation guides to meet the value-based care needs. It may help if we kind of focus in on our implementation guide use cases by putting them into some focus areas. There are five focus areas that I want to cover. We're going to take a deeper dive into one of them today, but let's talk just at a, at a higher level right now about what are the focus areas of the pain points of the general topics that we're trying to improve in healthcare information exchange. For quality improvements, we've been looking at data exchange for quality measurement reporting and gaps in care and related information. By having an efficient way of exchanging information between providers and payers, for instance, related to such as HEDIS measures and gaps in care, we can help care delivery, but we can also make sure that the clinicians have the information they need at the point of care, as well as supporting much more efficient payer uh, reconciliation of quality measurement related to contracting obligations and qualities. From a member access perspective, we have a handful of use cases that we've been focused on related to clinical data exchange, payer data exchange, some information related to formularies, provider directories, and payer coverage decision exchange when we need to have information uh, shared uh, with, from payer to payer. You'll notice the blue color related to patient cost transparency, and I just wanted to notate that the dark blue color really represents the use cases that are currently in the very early stages of discovery for the requirements, whereas everything else on the screen has evolved past initial discovery and is some form of finalization. For clinical data exchange, the use case focus area on the far right we have a handful of specific uh, use cases, and if you'll notice, there's payer data exchange and clinical data exchange within both this category and the category of member access. Because as we've created a way to exchange information between payers and providers, we are able to use that specification or the pipes that can be built with that specification to better exchange all kinds of payer or clinical data. So it will take 
it will meet multiple needs as we move forward. Also in clinical data exchange, uh, alerts and notifications are a pretty important topic for helping for care coordination. And we're looking at advancing some use cases around patient data services and performing lab reporting. But probably a pretty, pretty important underpinning to all of our work is the process improvement use case related to risk-based contract member identification. Think of this as knowing who is your patient panel and how that then enables you to do downstream efforts related to patient management and reporting obligations. In the near future, we'll be addressing the chronic illness documentation for risk adjustment as a, as a next priority use case. The final focus area that I want to dive into today and set ourselves up for a little bit deeper dive um, on the subsequent slides is the coverage and burden reduction focus area. This really creates a clinical conversation that enables us to more effectively handle prior authorization requests. So in this case, we really need to understand, are there coverage requirements for a patient? If there are coverage requirements, what are the rules related to that that would enable me to know whether I needed to and how to submit a prior authorization support request? So let's take a little bit of a deeper dive. We're going to review uh, these three use cases specifically. Uh, Corey, I didn't know if you wanted to uh, have any commentary at this point. Yeah, I was saying um, there's certainly a lot of great information that you provided there, and there's a lot of different use cases and focus areas um, that we're going to um, that Da Vinci is looking at, and uh, I was thinking if you, you know, wouldn't mind walking us through this specific focus area uh, around coverage and burden reduction, um, I think it might help make all of this a little bit more tangible for our audience. Um, if we explore the workflows that are actually being addressed, and so uh, to help illustrate the value and opportunities that these new use cases represent and um, how it can improve things for, for providers and, and patients. Sure. So let's start out with coverage requirements discovery. So providers need to easily discover which payer covered services or devices have specific documentation requirements, rules for determining the need for specific treatments and services, requirements related to prior authorization or prior auth uh, or other approvals. So with a FHIR-based Application Programming Interface, or an API, and FHIR is all about enabling API technologies and more efficient information exchange compared to electronic data interchange. Providers can discover in real time specific payer requirements that may affect the ability to have certain services or devices covered by the responsible payer. The discovery may be based on plan conditions, member identification in the event of a specific plan not being known at the time of the request. So when a, if, you, if you're thinking about an EHR, there's a clinician sitting there with patient Susie Q, needs to understand what the requirements are related to a service that the clinician would like to uh, have the patient obtain. Support staff will help the clinician understand what the coverage requirements are. In today's world, that can involve portals and faxes and phone calls. <laughs> In tomorrow's world, we hope that we will have, a, have the ability for the EHR using the coverage requirements discovery implementation guide to be able to send a message from the actual EHR to the payer system to find out what those coverage requirements are, enabling the payer to respond, hopefully in pretty darn near real time, back to the provider with any of the rules of the road that they need to follow related to that patient's insurance plan. 
So once the provider has asked the payer for information on the coverage rules and then determines that there is actually some step that needs to follow that initial request, the payer can return the document templates and payer rules to the provider and incorporate that into their workflow. This will help with medical necessity and clinical practices and helping to avoid surprise billing. The template rules have a variety of flavors as are shown on this slide. They can involve provider documentation requirements, aspects related to social determinants, information for, uh, for a variety of purposes like downstream needs to do prior authorization requests and help support doc specific documentation for quality measures. So as we're in this clinical conversation, the provider is at their EHR or their support staff is using the EHR tool to send a request to the payer. The payer responds, says, this is what I need you to do or what the rules are related to this patient's plan. At this point, then, the provider should have the information they need to be able to know whether they need to submit a prior authorization request and to be able to do so effectively using their EHR. The EHR will enable this FHIR-based solution to create the information from the EHR data, only needing a human to step in and actually provide what isn't available. So hopefully it can be a very automated message. And the prior authorization request can be generated. I've been talking a fair amount about FHIR and the HL7 FHIR standard, which the implementation specifications of DaVinci are using. But we understand that the national landscape obligates prior authorization requests to be done with in, uh, using the X12N 278 transaction. We understand that that current transformation is, uh, is, is necessary for compliance, uh, and we've provided for a solution uh, to ensure uh, compliance is fulfilled. Uh, clearing houses can help support that, but they can more especially um, uh, where there are mapping as aspects. And I think, Corey, I'd like to ask you if you'd like to talk a little bit about this very colorful slide uh, that kind of tries to put into one picture what I've just described over the last five minutes. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So um, this slide really brings those three use cases uh, together and shows how they complement each other uh, with an overarching workflow that is focused on transparency and reducing um, burden, uh, particularly for the provider. Uh, so <laughs> starting with the, the coverage requ uh, requirements discovery, uh, as Alex was talking about, um, this is really integrated into the provider workflow uh, with something called CDS hooks. And if you're not familiar with CDS hooks, it refers to clinical decision support hooks, which enable clinical decision support type solutions to be integrated uh, directly within the clinical workflow and inside a, an EHR or other clinical system that a, a provider or, or similar user might be using. Uh, and through CDS hooks, this in, um, information can be um, gathered in the form of uh, uh, this solution can, um, I'm sorry, CDS enabled solutions can then provide uh, what are called cards uh, that can give additional guidance or information uh, about the relevant uh, clinical situation. In this case, I'm talking about clinical requirements discovery, um, what kind of clinical or coverage uh, requirements are necessary for this patient given their clinical context. And uh, it may include a, an actual link to an application for a more interactive um, type of uh, type of transaction uh, where more inf clinical information can be provided um, by the provider um, to identify what those exact requirements are. Um, and uh, then the provider can utilize uh, the information that the payer then uh, provides back uh, in order to make treatment decisions. This information 
Uh, Fund to pair may include documentation templates and pair rules, uh, and then feed into our next uh, use case there of the, the documentation templates uh, and pair rule. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And uh, this uh, is also using uh, Fire APIs. This information, uh, this may include clinical guidance from the pair, um, specific guidance from the pair, and possibly requirements for prior authorization approval. And uh, this, of course, would inform the provider uh, that a prior authorization request is, um, needs to be submitted uh, for any particular type of treatment or service, uh, along with any clinical documentation that needs to go along with that request. Um, which, of course, leads us to our uh, last use case there of prior authorization support. As you can see, uh, the prior authorization uh, use case looks a little bit more complicated with the uh, more uh, colorful boxes there. Uh, but it's only because there are some you know, legal and, and regulatory requirements that we have to deal with HIPAA uh, around the type of for, um, type and format of the, the data um, that prior authorization requests need to appear um, in. And of course, that is the uh, X12-278, uh, which you see uh, there. Uh, however, while this looks more complicated, it actually isn't. Uh, we have prior auth transactions happening today in the form of these X12-278 messages, um, but we do not have, what we do not have much of uh, is the clinical information they are being shared, um, and, and um, that's handled mostly by that out-of-band communication, that, that uh, phone, fax, and mailing that I was talking about before. And um, what the prior authorization use case does, uh, support um, use case does, is enables the industry to leverage that current capability and extend it to include that clinical data. Uh, getting providers' clinical systems to speak uh, X12 line may be possible. Um, doesn't really sound like a worthwhile investment uh, across the entirety of the industry, um, particularly if they can already communicate with FHIR, um, which is you know, FHIR um, being you know, clinically focused. Um, what the implementation guide does is enable us to use the FHIR capability and connect it with a transformative layer that can transform uh, these, X, um, these into X12 transactions. So taking that FHIR-based uh, transactions that those clinical systems are, are more readily able to communicate and transforming them to the necessary X12 transactions, and that would be the, the 278 or if required, the, the 275. Um, so that, that's the sort of the, the additional clinical uh, documentation. Uh, on the payer side, uh, if the payer system, uh, a payer has a system that can already accept these X12 transactions uh, with the clinical information encoded within, then great, everything's good. Uh, alternatively, if a payer is using a newer system that speaks fires, no worries, uh, the transfer might uh, transformation layer uh, on the payer side there uh, see, is, is optional. Um, realistically, however, uh, it is likely that the payer will want to keep using uh, existing, their existing systems for prior authorization uh, and the information that they've historically been processing and then add in uh, clinical data capable systems uh, to store the clinical information uh, and process it and have some sort of link between those two systems. And uh, a transformative or transformation layer can be put in place uh, to meet that need as well. Uh, so, um, all of this helps to reduce the burden by improving uh, transparency uh, at the time that the provider um, is looking uh, at, within their workflow uh, of scheduling or ordering uh, certain services or treatment. Uh, they can get the, uh, what coverage requirements there are for a particular patient for um, a particular clinical context. Um, uh, that's of course reduces the effort around um, uh, you know, for the provider to determine that, right? Um, and uh, getting information about what uh, documentation is necessary uh, for prior authorization. Uh, there's no uh, none of these transactions involve a phone, fax, or, or mail, uh, and most of it can be synchronous, thereby providing information at the moment uh, of need inside the clinical workflow. A uh, provider uh, can make treatment decisions knowing what coverage requirements are there uh, for a given patient uh, right inside their 
kind of a workflow. There's um, guidance, uh, rules, and documentation requirements, and if prior authorization is required, they know right then when they're scheduling a service uh, or they're trying to order a treatment or whatnot. Uh, and if prior authorization is required, they will know what clinical information uh, will be necessary to submit. So they don't have to submit this prior authorization request only to get a, a denial saying that more information is required and uh, maybe they have to make a phone call or, or they get a letter saying you need to provide this documentation and then they mail something back, right? Um, this is all handled uh, through APIs and in an automated way. Uh, and, and this prior authorization request uh, has the ability to utilize a lot of the plumbing that we already have in place uh, for prior authorization today. Uh, we had a question uh, from an audience member about uh, sort of a real world example of how um, a patient visit uh, might be improved post Da Vinci and um, taking this focus area and specifically the prior authorization request, if I may be so bold um, to provide sort of an example that I had recently. Um, and uh, I was uh, recently uh, hospitalized. I had emergency surgery. Um, no worries, there's no HIPAA uh, violation here. I'm the patient, I'm <laughs> providing this information. Um, and um, I'm okay, uh, everything's fine. I'm here talking with you today. Uh, but when I got out of the hospital a week later, I got a letter from my insurance company saying that they uh, got this request for a service. Uh, it happened to be a service that determined I actually needed to be <laughs> have emergency surgery and be hospitalized, uh, saying uh, we need to do prior authorization on this. We need to make sure that this is necessary. <laughs> well, you know, I was like, well, I hope you guys figured that out. Um, <laughs> But, um, you know, so it, it causes like some confusion to the patient uh, and uh, some concern like, well, what does this mean for me, uh, for, for my billing, am I going to have to take care of all this, what, what does it mean? And uh, just in that small example, um, that, that transaction didn't, wasn't necessary. I didn't have to get that letter uh, necessarily, right? Um, with DaVinci, a lot of this will be in line. And there's plenty of use cases where um, patients need to know, need to have transparency about what care they can, and treatment they can uh, get covered. Um, some uh, more uh, quickly than others. Sometimes um, we have more um, pressing uh, procedures that need to be done and we don't want to have to wait for that phone tag and mail and um, back and forth and personally I think this will do a lot uh, for our industry improving that. So um, Alex, I get back to you. Thanks Corey. So we've given you a window into the DaVinci project. Uh, wanna Make sure that you're aware of how to get some additional information about the implementation specifications that are being developed. Um, for those of you who are in the day-to-day -day healthcare delivery or reimbursement methodology, you probably aren't going to necessarily pick up an IT and implement it, but you may want to know some general information about our product, uh, uh, get some updates on the project's progress, and you can certainly follow um, us by uh, signing up for our listservs, uh, checking out some background collateral, uh, being able to take a look at the current slide decks, uh, or even just check on the status of an implementation guide if you're looking uh, to be able to have a conversation with your vendor. Uh, there are on this slide, and you'll certainly be getting the slide deck uh, after today if not already, uh, thanks to Beckers. Uh, but what we want to make sure you understand is that uh, this the success of this project will really happen when we as a nation have picked up and incorporated these standards into our products and services and have workflows that enable us to actually harness the power of the API technology and the much more um, efficient uh, uh, data integration aspects that we're seeking and needing in value-based care to make it successful. 
to help the uh, marketplace uh, do that, uh, we have uh, reference implementation sample code so that we can test out our solutions, our implementation guide specifications, and prove them out along the way. Uh, we have, as you may have seen earlier, uh, a very large uh, number of members. I think we're approaching 50 members uh, that are rolling up their sleeves and actively engaging in our uh, product development, our implementation guide development. Uh, we have tremendous representation from our EHR uh, and uh, Pay, uh, payer and provider and vendor communities. Um, but what we are doing through this webinar today is hoping to make sure that you're aware of the increased opportunities for efficiency uh, and that will support some of what we anticipate as being recognition in the EHR certification program uh, for FIRE APIs and also uh, looking, for, looking forward to the final rules uh, that we will receive from CMS uh, related to some of their objectives. Uh, they are already one of our leading uh, users of our uh, CRD, Coverage Requirements Discovery and Document Templates requirements as a part of their Documentation Requirements Lookup service that they're using um, as part of their services to their community. So I encourage you to take a look um, at some of these resources. Uh, more specifically, I wanted to hone in on confluence.hl7.org. Uh, this is our collaboration space. Uh, the majority of our information is all in one place um, on this uh, Confluence page. It's publicly accessible uh, for anyone who's interested in taking a look at it. Uh, you don't even need credentials to get in to just poke around and look at the data, uh, but it will give you uh, lots of good information information uh, to help you understand uh, the DaVinci project. Uh, and uh, also when you're at the Confluence.hl7 page, you can also take a look at some of the fire other fire accelerator programs that are tackling uh, very specific topics like social determinants of health. There's a, a fire accelerator program called Gravity. So uh, they also have uh, information on their website or on the Confluence collaboration space. We've talked a lot about the DaVinci project and sort of what's been our use case stable and giving you a sample into our coverage burden reduction uh, use case topics. Uh, but let me pivot from the past to sort of where we're headed. Uh, the 2020 is going to be a really busy year. Uh, as I noted, we're all waiting for some of those CMS rules and ONC rules to drop. Um, but meanwhile, um, we are off busy maturing the use cases that we've already developed uh, and advancing uh, towards the additional use cases that are there in the pipeline. We go through a very uh, rigorous process every year of working with uh, not only our members, but more especially in public-facing conference calls to develop the implementation guides and to test them out, as I've been noting. When we, the, the event of testing in the HL7 world is called a Connectathon. It's where we all get together and have a geek fest around a bunch of tables for a couple of days and actually roll up our sleeves and test code and, and see how things work, not only um, within the, the sample code, but more especially especially as we think about how that code and the implementation guide transforms back into our organizational infrastructure and technologies. So we will be advancing uh, some new implementation guides this year, as well as maturing uh, beyond the initial or first or second version of an implementation guide uh, as we are uh, starting to get some substantial member uptake uh, with deploying the implementation guides that I showcased earlier. And we're going to continue to take those lessons learned back into uh, the implementation guides and mature them uh, for the marketplace. So this uh, slide gives you sort of a snapshot for 2020 of the work that we're going to be doing, uh, especially uh, a nice benchmark is our HIMSS demonstration. Uh, we'll have uh, people showing real-world code um, at uh, HIMSS. We not only have a, a demonstration a theater, uh, I'm sorry, we have a theater for general presentations, but then we also have a booth that's very focused around um, our members uh, demonstrating uh, their products uh, using these standards. Have some contact information in here if you need, uh, have a question about DaVinci you want to reach out to me. Uh, I think at this point I probably want to turn it over to Corey uh, to uh, bring us home before we answer Q&A. 
Yeah, and as we – thanks, Alex. Um, very much appreciated. Thanks for all this great information. Um, I see from a number of questions we have a really um, engaged and interested audience here. Um, but uh, so as we wrap up, before we take those questions, we'd like to thank everyone for joining, um, joining us today um, and for Becker's uh, for the ability to sponsor this webinar. We're in a brave new world of interoperability um, that initiatives like the Da Vinci Project will accelerate and serve to improve care delivery. Things are moving quickly, and the speed will really only increase. There is a lot to be done to get us from here to there. And to get there um, does mean implementing new processes and solutions, um, but does not necessarily require ripping out existing technology or waiting for all vendors to eventually upgrade their systems to support these use cases. There are solutions out there uh, with the power and flexibility to grow with your changing and ever-increasing needs. Um, solutions such as what Infor provides uh, that enable providers and payers alike to utilize and integrate with many of the current systems and interoperability investments to transform and orchestrate existing data feeds and interfaces, aggregate, store, and normalize HL7 and CDA data feeds across systems, and to manage these new fire-based APIs to ensure consistent and secure access. Um, if you'd like more information, uh, you can feel free to contact me. My uh, email is up there. Um, and also visit us on our website. Uh, if you're at HIMSS, we'd like to invite you to our booth. Uh, also, please come see um, these use cases in action uh, and hear presentations from uh, the DaVinci booths uh, near the interoperability showcases, as Alex mentioned. Uh, so uh, for that, uh, we're going to uh, look through these, uh, these questions. We'll see which uh, ones we can answer here. Um, and if not, we'll make sure we, we have all these questions logged and we'll make sure we get back to you. Um, I think the first I'd like to cover is, uh, Alex, how um, does the work that DaVinci is doing relate to sort of other industry activities? And I know, Alex, you've done work in X12 and um, the ONC's Office of National Coordinators uh, Fire uh, at Scale Task Force. Um, and when I see this question, I think of both of those. So maybe you can uh, provide some context and, and see um, and how these activities align. Great, great question, Corey. Um, so how these all align. So first let's talk about the ONC Fire at Scale Task Force. So FHIR, let's just make sure everyone's clear, that's an HL7 standard, Fast Healthcare Interoperability Resource. It is a nuts and bolts data exchange standard. The implementation guides that Da Vinci's building provides the rules of the road about how to accomplish a specific business function using the FHIR HL7 standard. So think of that as little cars with specific purposes and payloads um, that we need to get from payers to providers and back again. But as we start to think about scaling, millions, maybe billions of transaction, clinical conversations between payers and providers, there are certain issues that need to be tackled. That underscore the national kind of um, objective to more efficient clinical information exchange. And as such, ONC recognized and has been working with industry on figuring out some of those broader, bigger, overarching issues that the industry has with wanting to use the discrete FHIR implementation guide payloads. For instance, Identity reconciliation. Another example, how do I find my endpoint, my fire endpoint over at payer, Acme Payer when I am Main Street doctor? How do I find Acme Payer? And how do I know that my EHR can talk to the payer system? Well, the way we find things like that is we have a directory and we have to have rules of the road related to that. Another example, how do we manage the different versions of FHIR and implementation guides? 
that are produced using that FIRE standard? How do we scale the number of transactions in the nation, ensure that we have the infrastructure to support the potential Uber number of uh, transactions flowing? So ONC FAST is tackling those more overarching policy and rules of the road issues, whereas a project like Da Vinci is tackling the specific payload problem-solving dynamic in our implementation guides. I like to think of this as sort of the interstate highway system is ONC fast and Da Vinci's little cars and trucks and buses and mopeds traversing it. When we think of it, so that's how ONC fast and fire kind of play together. Let me then talk about the X12 aspect. When we looked at the slide, uh, the very busy colorful slide, uh, maybe I need to back up so we can look at that. When I look at the payload, uh, this slide, what we see is that there are X12 transactions in the middle. Currently under the HIPAA law and its ensuing regulations, we have adopted a national standards for performing prior authorization. That is a 278 transaction in shorthand. That prior authorization 278 currently is sitting in the middle of the FIRE API exchanges to ensure that we can be compliant. Until we get some regulatory relief, we'll need to make sure that we're compliant and throughout the entire end-to-end -end flow at some point. So X12 and HL7 Da Vinci have worked together to create the necessary crosswalks for the prior authorization support implementation guide into a 278 and back out again. So those are those two organizations or efforts are, are working with a uh, Da Vinci effort. All right. Thank you, uh, Alex. We have a couple of questions uh, that are along the same line. And uh, what is the scope of the organizations implementing these use cases? Or um, how many organizations are implementing any of this? Uh, so I guess you probably start with who's participating, right? Um, and uh, are there multiple across the country? How many? And are there any of these use cases alive? Great set of questions. Let me see if I can handle all of those um, in a, se a good sequence here. So first, let's start out with the membership by primary industry role slide. I went back to this slide because it really helps uh, break out the providers, the payers, the vendors, and our partners. So our uh, these are the people that in some shape or form have made a commitment by, standing, by signing a statement of understanding that they are going to be a Da Vinci member, they're going to contribute to the body of work, and they're going to pick up the implementation guide or guides and implement them. The goal being here is that this is a uh, this is not an academic exercise. This is a real-world problem-solving exercise. And that we knew that we needed to build standards, and we knew we needed to build them at a rapid pace uh, to meet industry needs. So Da Vinci uh, brought together a number of uh, people who have deep standards experience and figured out how we could actually rapidly develop solid solutions. We have several of our members who are on the cusp of publicly announcing their, their implementation of uh, use cases such as uh, the medication reconciliation uh, quality measurement uh, use case, the DEC, DEQM, Data Exchange for Quality Measurement. First flavor of uh, quality measurement was the medication reconciliation. So we have folks doing that. We have folks like CMS who've uh, used CRD and ETR, the coverage requirements and document templates as a part of their document DRLS uh, solution. Uh, we have uh, dubbed 2020 the year of implementation. Um, I think that's pretty impressive when we have a two, two years under our belt. We've developed um, a lot of implementation guides in collaboration with our members and that they've actually, as a part of signing on to the project, committed to deploying the solutions and that you can see that the ones that are in the dark red, the kind of burnt red, brown color at the top of the screen, these have all matured at least once through the formal balloting process. There's a 
is this really good feedback loop uh, from the industry and that now our uh, members and beyond are picking these up and implementing them into their products and services. So that means that we've got uh, a number of uh, members who have uh, worked on developing the guides and then put the guides into their product pipelines uh, to en enable those services to be available to our provider and payer communities. Uh, so there, uh, our members are all at a variety of stages in deploying their uh, solutions and making them available to their clients. At the same time that that's happening, we're having a variety of conversations and doing presentations like today to promote awareness because this is not really just a technology problem. This is about using technology to let our humans focus their energies more precisely on what matters and where there's greater value and letting the technology do some of the underpinning work. And so that means that organizations, payers, providers, uh, clinically integrated networks and hospital systems, et cetera, need to be thinking about how to reduce their burden by modernizing their workflows to leverage the technology that their vendors are, are making available. We are expecting through our collaboration um, with the federal government, and more especially through our re review of the proposed rules from ONC and from CMS, uh, that uh, certified electronic health records will need to have fire API capabilities, uh, and that, that the underlying certification requirement will help uh, spur a lot of adoption efforts. We also are seeing uh, from the CMS rule uh, thoughts around uh, uh, coverage decision exchanges between payers. Uh, so we're expecting that some of the policy from the CMS payer side of the house uh, covering Medicare, Medicaid, CHIP, and uh, the exchanges will also uh, deliver more of an implementation uh, volume uh, into the national landscape. Uh, and I think this is a pretty amazing trajectory in just over two years uh, from the time that DaVinci was envisioned uh, to, the, to uh, actually being able to showcase, uh, especially at HIMSS, uh, the real-world deployments. I hope I covered all your questions. And... Well, I think that was, that was very helpful. Um, the next question is actually, there's two questions, and maybe I'll take the first part and you can take the second part. Is the goal of this process to have third-party software to facilitate this integration, or will this be a module with existing EHR systems? That's the first question. And the second one, is it limited to procedures and services provided uh, by DaVinci only? So uh, if on the first question there, uh, the answer is all the above. Uh, there are EHR systems uh, that are actively involved um, with the, the development of uh, the, the implementation guides um, that the DaVinci project is, is working on. Uh, they are developing their solutions to meet these requirements. They'll be presenting uh, some of their work so far uh, at HIMSS. Um, again, come visit the, uh, the DaVinci booth. Um, and there will be uh, third-party solutions uh, that can help facilitate a number of these use cases as well. Cool. I think that was a really good answer because, you know, as, as we have all adopted technology advancements over the last 30 years, uh, we have all made discrete independent decisions about what was best for our organization with our priorities, our business models, and our strategies. And so, the Da Vinci uh, implementation guides um, will need to fit into uh, organizational solutions as they best fit. So the Da Vinci implementation guides are freely available to everyone anywhere who wants to go to Confluence and pick it up and use it. Uh, it is not just for DaVinci members, although there are members that have contributed dollars and resources to build those implementation guides. We have done that work in the light of day, fully transparent and engaging industry. The uh, balloted solutions are recognized as HL7 products and are freely available to anyone who wants to pick it up and use it, which I think is really great service to the nation. Um, so anybody uh, can uh, deploy the product if they want to, or they can go um, get a vendor to meet their needs. 
Okay. Great. Um, and you know, to the second part of that question, um, also, uh, is it uh, limited to procedures and services provided by Da Vinci? Um, there, da Vinci is specifically de addressing these use cases, and it may expand to other use cases, but there's a lot of work being done in the industry. Um, da Vinci is one, what we call acceleration project in, in HL7, dealing with a, a specific set of use cases. We have another one uh, called Argonaut, which is addressing uh, the um, the needs for you know the, the what was termed the meaningful use program plus additional use cases like scheduling and, and provider directories. Um, there's another one. Uh, was it Alex? Was it uh, Gravity? Yes. Mm -hmm. Dealing it's with um, of health and yeah. yeah. So there's a lot of activities, and these are. Um, all based on fire, and we have a lot of EHRs and technic, um, other vendors, IT vendors, that are participating in this, um, and they are um, purposely aligned. So, for example, the DaVinci uh, use cases here utilize the, um, the U.S. core um, sort of profiles, implementation guides, the requirements for that U.S. core that was um, uh, being used for certification of EHR technology. Um, it's the same base requirements or same base implementation guides and profiles that um, the Argonaut's using uh, and that Gravity is using. Yeah, I think it's a really good point that uh, that all these fire accelerator programs are within the HL7 uh, umbrella and that actually sometimes when we are demonstrating solutions in the Da Vinci uh, booth, we're actually using some of the Argonaut standards. And when Gravity is uh, figuring out how to get their arms around social determinants of health, they're actually leveraging some of the Da Vinci work. And so what we're trying to do is figure out the right containers and the right contents in those containers to solve a specific need, but we are, are very mindful of being efficient in that we are a community all based around the FHIR Fast Healthcare Interoperability Resource Standard from HL7, and uh, so there's, there's a lot of reuse um, and a uh, very um, big focus on not reinventing the wheel or overlapping, uh, so that's why our uh, FHIR Accelerator uh, leaders uh, all coordinate with each other on a regular basis in addition to their coordination with uh, ONC's FHIR at Scale Task Force. Great. Thanks, Alex. So we have time for one, maybe two questions, depending on how long the answer is for this one. Um, <clears throat> can you speak about the process once the Da Vinci project uh, implementation guides are, are ready to deploy? Who's driving adoption? Um, do you see this as voluntary or mandated? And I think um, from my perspective, I'm curious is, you know, C I think CMS is driving a lot of this, right? Um, but how does that um, who does that affect, the CMS kind of rules? And then uh, how about everyone else? So from an implementation guide perspective, once we've uh, developed the IG or implementation guide and we've got it uh, through recognized as a standard for trial use, we then, um, our community of members are the ones who are picking it up initially. Uh, there are... Um, Definitely the policy levers uh, related to the ONC certification uh, rule that's anticipated to drop here shortly and the uh, CMS policy framework related to payer uh, requirements. Uh, we're expecting that to drop and give us an additional push uh, for uh, pickup of these implementation guides um, in the marketplace. Uh, we within the Da Vinci community are promoting um, within our membership, we're really pivoting from the IG development into promoting uh, implementation efforts and helping to cross-pollinate um, discussions among payer providers and their vendors uh, to support um, the vendor platforms, whether it's an EHR or a, a, a translation service, et cetera, um, in using these implementation guides and enabling the efficiencies to be garnered by their clients.
right. I don't know if we have time and, for another um, question or not. No, I think we're about done. Let me let me just uh, add to that. Uh, the the CMS rules, of course, there's a proposal we're waiting for a final rule, um, but it it directly affects um, Medicare, Medicaid um, related uh, care, right? Uh, but as CMS goes, personally, I, I've seen <laughs> so does the industry, right? And I think uh, you know. The, the CMS rule um, is certainly sort of like the trigger point here, um, but I think the industry is ready for this. There's a lot of improvement, process improvement, um, reduction of burden that's really necessary in the industry. And so uh, I, I think um, while some of it uh, will be mandated, I think a lot of it's going to be driven by just demand uh, in the industry and need. So uh, that's, that's really all we have time for. Because oh, really sorry, yeah, fi fi I'm just, I think it's a really good point because fire as a data model is something a lot of people are embracing as they modernize their technologies and all the historical um, interfaces and design decisions that they've made. They're now finding a way to weave that all together and fire is helping with that. And that's actually, I think, an underpinning driver of why you see so many industry leaders uh, playing at the Da Vinci table because they were already adopting fire for their internal purposes. Right. Well, we are over time. I wanted I want to thank everyone for joining us here today. Thank you, Alex, for giving us this presentation on Da Vinci. I hope it was very informative. It was informative to me, actually. Uh, still, <laughs> always learning. Right. Um, and uh, thank you uh, to uh, Beckers uh, for allowing us to sponsor this uh, this webinar today. Uh, thank you, and have a great rest of your day. <laughs>